All right. Um, well, thank you all so much for coming. Um, you know, like like we briefly mentioned, um, I implemented the LLM's school calling functionality into the OpenAI compatible server. Um, and today we're going to kind of dive into um, what that means. Um, you know, we'll cover a little bit about what tools and functions are and why they matter for um, for anyone who's not familiar with it. We'll talk about some challenges that I faced during the implementation. Um, and then kind of the direction that open source seems to be moving with tool calling and functions in general. Um, I will uh, try not to bore you to death, although uh, I do have to say when I did a dry run of this deck with my fiance the other night, who is non-technical, she did actually literally fall asleep in the middle of it. So we'll um, we'll have to keep our fingers crossed here. <laughs> um, so... Let's start by looking at what functions and tools are, um, because sometimes the terms are used interchangeably, and that's because for the most part, they are interchangeable. OpenAI originally introduced functions as a feature in the chat completions API, and in that API, you could provide a list of user-defined functions that the LM could call, each one described by name, and a JSON schema for the arguments object. Like for chat completions, OpenAI's API became the standard for open source, um, kind of just like how you know, VLLM and most of the other model serving frameworks adopted OpenAI's API spec um, just to make things more adoptable. So most tooling relies on OpenAI compatible function calls and assumes OpenAI's JSON schema. Um, the, the thing about functions is that the LM could decide when to call a tool. Um, so it could say, you know, it, it could pick from a list of tools. You could force it to call one. You could prevent it from calling one at all. Um, and you can let it decide based on the context and when it has enough information and when it decides that it's appropriate to call the tool. Um, to call a tool, uh, the model generates, or excuse me, to call function, I'm getting ahead of myself. To call a function, the model would generate the name of the function that it wanted to call, along with a JSON object containing the arguments. Um, you, the API consumer, i.e. probably the application between you know, OpenAI and the end user, um, would pass these parameters into a function that you defined, execute the function, whether that's an API call, database lookup, or something more or less complicated, and then provide the return value or results of that call to the language model. And it would then interpret the results for the user, um, make additional calls depending on um, what it had been instructed to do, and so forth. The important thing here is that the user, you, not the end user, is giving the language model a set of ways to interact with external systems in a predefined way and allowing the model to decide when it is contextually appropriate to do so and to control the inputs to those functions based on the conversation and based on um, the information that it has to whatever extent is desired. So th this is really powerful because it allows you to kind of integrate the fuzzy logic um, of language and intentions and context that language models are great at. Um, but to integrate that, to take external actions that traditional computing systems are great at, um, you know, I, I listed examples, APIs, databases, and stuff, when and how the language model decides that it's appropriate and relevant to do that. So this really lets you kind of get outside the realm of just building a like a chat bot or, um, you know, something that generates copy and so forth. It, led, it, it unlocks a lot of possibilities. So what happened then is the OpenAI then deprecated the functions API in favor of tools. Tools are just an abstraction on top of functions that provides for not just user-defined functions, but also additional um, kind of built-in functions provided by OpenAI, um, examples of which are the code interpreter and web search and so forth that the user doesn't have to explicitly provide to the model. The JSON structure of a tool call is a little more complicated than a function call. Um, to provide for this abstraction, but it's basically the same. Um, most open source models use um, functions schema for tool calling because they don't have predefined tools available to them um, since they tend to be reliant on whatever the user wants them to do. That being said, um, more and more open source models are actually starting to come with built-in tools, um, which you still have to enable uh, usually through the chat template and which you still have to actually execute the tool that it wants to use, but it's been trained to know about certain tools um, and to use them so that it's it's better and more accurate and precise about when and how and where it calls those tools. 
An example of this is Llama 3.1. Um, those models know about, I think, a Brave or DuckDuckGo search tool. Um, for web search, there is a Wolfram Alpha tool built into it. And um, so this is becoming more, more popular in open source models. Um, the benefit of this, like I said, is that models have been trained with these specific functions and know when and how to use them really well, as opposed to kind of zero shot or one shot function calling. Um, and like I said, though, you still have to have a framework that actually supports um, extracting the, the tool call and making actual API calls and providing the results to the model. So it, it doesn't just work like magic when the model has built in tool calling. Uh, so now that we know what tools are, let's talk about why they matter. Tools let you give your compatible tool calling language model capabilities. Anything that you can express in code and make into a callable function, which is for the most part anything, your language model can now interact with. Um, examples of popular uses of this are web search, uh, database lookups, for example, things like text to SQL, um, saving and loading memories, uh, code interpreters, and Interestingly, um, even robotics applications, um, especially when combined with vision language models. Um, and of course, agents, right? The primary benefit of this is um, that it lets you use language models and now VLLM for building agentic applications, which you previously couldn't do with VLLM. OpenAI compatible tool calling in VLLM allows you to use off the shelf OpenAI compatible tooling, whether that's OpenAI's SDK, um, Versal's AI SDK, which is popular in the React and Next.js world, or or a, kind of any of this plethora of tools that are already out there, um, it lets you use them without having to care about the model's underlying tool syntax. So VLLM's tool calling API um, in the OpenAI compatible server gives you the benefit of abstraction so that you can use the tools you want without having to care about what the model's doing. Um, just so that you don't have to deal with all the minutia and details of the model's format. So historically, this has been one of the biggest gaps between closed source language model APIs and open source language models. Tool calling is very hard to do with open models and was completely model specific. Um, each open source model has its own syntax for generating tool calls. Um, you had to use a tool chain designed to work with your model, um, whether that's Hermes, Mistral, um, Llama or something else, which really sucks if you want to build in a model agnostic way, which is super important with how fast new language models are created and released. And, you know, a three or six month old model is, is frequently significantly behind the state of the art. So being able to build in a model agnostic way is really important. Um, and it was hard to do that to build agentic applications in a model agnostic way on open source models. Um, and to my knowledge, not a single uh, popular inference server, Llama.cpp, Olama, um, text generation interface, supported OpenAI compatible tool um, tools in their API and streaming. Streaming is an absolute necessity when you're building end user facing applications because you want users to be able to see what the language model is generating um, without waiting 5, 10, 15 seconds, depending on what you're doing for the entire response. So when you're building user interactive applications, you need streaming, but you also want the language model to be able to use tools. Um, and and so you kind of had this tension between wanting streaming, wanting tools, and you couldn't get both with open source frameworks. Um, and unfortunately, you couldn't tell ahead of time, unless you're forcing a tool call, if the language model is going to generate text or tools. Um, so you couldn't toggle streaming on or off depending on tool calls. So there's really this, there was this necessity for supporting tool streaming to enable this entire whole world of use cases for open source models. Um, so these were all really good motivations for building tool support into VLLM. Um, it was also a really commonly requested feature, um, both on GitHub and I and on Discord. Um, and so I I needed it for some stuff I was building and decided to sit down and do it. Um, so to do this, um, I had to do a couple of things. The first one was ensuring that open source models um, had tool calling chat templates that work, that include tools in the prompts, because there wasn't, at this time, there was a lack of standardization around this. That's gotten better even in the past couple months. Um, and some open models also need additional prompting to work well with tools. Um, so for example, to handle parallel tool calling well, um, other models needed specific configurations, 
And so I had to figure kind of all of this out, provide tweaks, chat templates, and figure out what configurations actually work to even get the models to consistently generate tool calls so that I could even build the feature. Um, the second one was, or I guess my numbering is off, but I had to ensure that VLLM implemented OpenAI spec for tool calls for non-streaming tools. And then I had to implement tool streaming. Like I said, nowhere else did this. So there wasn't really a reference application to use. Um, and it turns out that there's a good reason for this and that it's because it's really, really hard to do this. It's a non-trivial problem. You have to translate the language model's own tool or function call format into OpenAI's tool call streaming deltas on the fly, um, more or less one token at a time. And as I noted, uh, different open source models or family of families of models use different formats to indicate um, when they want to call functions. And so each one needed a custom tool parser or extractor, both for uh, for non-streaming requests, which is much easier, and then also for streaming requests. Uh, so there were, <laughs> it was a lot. Um, like Michael said, it kind of took us a couple months to 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 really land the feature. Um, so the the challenges, and I'll, I'll breeze through this pretty quickly because I already mentioned most of these. Um, there were a variety of challenges, um, especially with open source models. Um, there's a lack of standardization. Um, each model has its own format. Uh, that format has to be extracted differently for each model. Um, there's quality issues too, right? Some models are just kind of better than others at tool calling. Uh, small models have a hard time with tool calling already, although they've gotten much better. Um, but it wasn't even until recently that small models could do this at all, really, um, much less consistently. Um, that's more or less the development of, I would say, probably the past six months is actually decent tool calling in sub 10 billion parameter models. Um, some models were also trained for specific tool use cases. So for example, um, some models are really great at multi-turn conversations with tool calling and for agentic use cases. Um, this, you know, for example, uh, Salesforce's XLAM models are great for agentic stuff. Hermes models are great for agentic stuff. Um, and others, um, some small models could generate tool calls, but struggled with multi-turn conversations involving them. Um, and others don't do parallel tool calls. Um, some models had kind of unique gotchas too, right? So for example, um, Strahl's 7B model 0.3, the tools only really work at a temperature of zero. Um, this isn't really documented even in Mistral's documentation, but you do see this in all of their example code that the temperature is set to zero. Uh, they also didn't have an official chat template with tool call support. They have their own library that they use for uh, chat templating and tokenization. Um, so that we had to put together a chat template that kind of matched one-to-one -one token parity with Mistral's inference library um, because tool calling is super, super, super sensitive to chat template and tokenization issues. If your chat template has a bug in it or if you're not using the right tokenizer, do it like you should not expect tool calling to work. So that was really, really important um, for getting that to work. Um, uh, Llama 3.1 uh, doesn't support parallel tool calls um, and the smaller Llama uh, 3.1 and 3.2 models are designed for not for multi-turn conversations, right? They kind of expect a prompt, they'll generate a tool call, and then that's it. They don't inherently know how to handle multi-turn conversations. Um, when you provide tool results back to them, what we found was they just will keep trying to call the same tool. They won't, They didn't know to interpret the result for the user unless you told them to in the, the template. So there's a lot of different gotchas. Um, those are just a couple of them. Um, most of these problems are more prevalent for small models. And then last, uh, streaming. Like I said, it, you are translating one structured format to another structured format on the fly, um, which is pretty tricky. And we'll get more into the internals of that in a minute. Um, but to help illustrate what I'm talking about in terms of extracting open source models, tool call syntax, and OpenAI's tool call format, um, both for streaming and for regular completions, uh, these are examples of open source uh, tool call formats for um, Mistral on the bottom and for Hermes, which were the first two models um, or model families, I guess, that I implemented. Uh, both support parallel tool calls, um, but they do it differently. Um, Hermes doesn't use an array, right? The Hermes on top will just include a second set of the tool call XML tags um, 
with the JSON object um, inside of it after the first pair, um, whereas Mistral will include a second call in the array um, that follows tool calls. I'm actually missing an open square bracket after um, after tool calls here. There should be a square bracket right there. Um, but so its format supports this and it will try to do this, but um, you really, really have to prompt it to do this even at zero temperatures because otherwise you won't get consistent results. So you can see how it's not terribly difficult to extract function calls from this. Um, they're structured the same in terms of the name and the arguments. Um, just the start and end indicators are different. Uh, and these are two easy examples. They're more complicated ones. Um, but generally, this is kind of what we're looking at. There's a token that indicates the start of a tool call, a token that indicates the end of it sometimes. Um, and then the name and arguments of the uh, function call or the tool call. So let's talk about actually extracting this into OpenAI's format. Um, because of each model's unique format, the architectural solution that I landed at was to create a tool parser module for each model that I wanted to support. You can think of this as a chat template, but kind of in reverse. So instead of taking a standard list of messages and formatting it into the model's preferred prompts format, um, you know, chat ML, llama, whatever, it would take the model's unique tool call format and extract it into a standardized format. So it's kind of doing the opposite of a chat template. Um, for non-streaming chat completions, uh, extracting tools from uh, a model's unique format is generally pretty easy. You have a regex that looks for the JSON object and a response. And if it's present, um, you you extract the function name and arguments before formatting it into an open AI tool call uh, chat completion response. So here's an example of what that looks like. At the top of the slide, there's the Hermes tool call um, syntax again. Uh, there's also a note up there, Quen uh, adopted this for their Quen 2.5 models. So Hermes and Quen uh, use the same format. Um, but you can see that the function name in, is present in the OpenAI um, function call below. This is an OpenAI chat completion response um, for uh, tools. So the, the name is present one-to-one. -one. Um, and then the arguments object is actually in the top, it's just presented as part of the JSON object. In OpenAI's specification, uh, the arguments object is stringified, so there are escape characters present, which is really important, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but generally speaking, that's a really simple extraction. You define a regex that looks for each of these fields. Um, if they're both present, you extract it into this format and, and return that to the client. So it's very simple, um, which brings us to streaming. This slide's a little bit messier. Uh, this is the same example of Hermes' tool calling format on the left, but on the right is a snippet of some of the OpenAI compatible server sent events that have to be sent for tool streaming. Obviously, this is very complicated and dense. Um, a lot of the fields that you see in the objects on the right are actually protocol related rather than related to the semantics of the tool call. So I cleaned it up a little bit to make that easier to read. So this is what it looks like cleaned up. Uh, you can see that the first message contains the message role, which is the assistant, um, a null content field. Sometimes that could be a string um, if the model says something and calls the tool, although that's uncommon, and a, a tool calls array. So that array sets up the function um, information type sets a function as opposed to like code interpreter or something, and it has the ID and a function name. Um, note that the function name here is present in entirety, unlike the arguments diffs below it, um, which are all of these, it's diffs of a stringified JSON object. Function name is present in entirety, even though it's more than one token. Um, this is always the case. Um, it's always in a single Delta message. Um, it's never broken up across multiple. And then below that, these are, you know, again, the arguments diffs, um, the, this is not the raw JSON that you see here. It is stringified. The tokens like the, are not one-to-one -one here and here if you concatenated them because of escape characters and because of JSON stringification. So to clarify, we are not streaming just these JSON tokens as the model generates them. Um, we're streaming diffs of the JSON stringified arguments object as the LLM is generating it. But we have to do that before we have a complete JSON object to stringify, right? You know, if the model is only halfway through the arguments, we should be sending diffs of the stringified JSON object, even though we don't have a complete JSON object yet. Um, and so it turns out that that presents some serious challenges, which I'll break down in a bit. But 
the important kind of takeaway from this slide is that we are translating one format into another format on the fly as it's being generated. Um, and so we, yeah, there's a lot of parsing and extraction challenges associated with that. So this is really the core problem of implementing OpenAI compatible tool streaming for arbitrary open source language models. And this is why nowhere else implemented it yet is because that's a really hard problem to solve. Um, as the model is generating tokens, we have to detect if the model is generating a tool or function call. Um, as we saw, generally speaking, there is a token that indicates that. Um, in this case, this is actually added to the tokenizer. It's not multiple tokens, even though you would think it would be. The tool call XML tag is in the tokenizer. Generally speaking, that's how models do it, is they'll have a token that indicates the start of the tool call. So we detect if the model is generating a, a, a function or tool call. Um, and then to get the information that we need out of the generation as it's being streamed so that we can stream arguments diffs, we have to do partial JSON parsing. So this is um, it, it, one of the approaches that I looked at was extracting the information instead of using partial JSON parsing, um, it was extracting the information for the diffs uh, using regex. The problem is that extracting arbitrary information from arbitrarily structured JSON objects with regex is unreliable and difficult, and you can run into other problems like um, uh, like denial of service conditions created by um, lookbacks that aren't handled properly. Um, and as I noted earlier, again, we're not streaming JSON directly, right? These are not the tokens that are here because there's escape characters. <clears throat> We're streaming chunks of an escape JSON string representing the entire JSON object. So we have to partially parse the function call to get the relevant part stringified and escaped. Um, and then we we start streaming the function's name once it's been completely generated. And then once the arguments start being generated, we have to extract the diff of the arguments and stream it. <clears throat> so to, to illustrate what I'm talking about in terms of partial JSON parsing, um, because this is not a super common concept. Uh, I included some examples. Um, there are two modes that you can do partial JSON parsing in. Um, the first one is um, where you can show um, or where you can not show incomplete fields. So you see this at top um, where um, we haven't streamed, um, for example, here, um, like my name, for example, Kyle, this field is not completed yet. And so it's not in the results object. Um, same thing for the TR here, right? Even the Boolean field isn't completed yet, and so it's not in the result until the entire field is present. Um, in the bottom with incomplete fields enabled, um, you do it does actually infer um, the partial field. So name um, with KY, you would actually get this in the result, and then um, like TR is inferred to true. And so it, it's kind of smarter and lets you get ahead of yourself, so to speak. Um, the top mode is how we parse the function call object that the model is generating when the name has not been streamed yet, because the name of the function call has to be streamed all at once, and it can't be done partially. So this is how we stream or how we parse the object until we send the name, because we never send a diff of the name. We just send the entire name. Once the arguments object is available, we switch to incomplete field parsing so that we can send diffs like we saw on the previous slide rather than waiting for an entire field to have to be generated. Um, for some extra illustration, this is what a tool call looks like as it's being generated one token at a time. Um, I, I kind of freehanded this. This isn't actually done based on the model's actual tokenizer. Um, but to do tool streaming, as the model generates new tokens, um, we have to reparse the entire um, generation at once, um, find, and find the difference of it um, do our extraction, find the difference of the arguments object, and then stream that to the client. Um, and I apologize in advance. Unfortunately, this is where the nice visuals with code highlighting end, um, and Microsoft Excel screenshots begin, um, <laughs> because it just got a little information dense. Um, so as promised, Excel screenshot, um, this walks us through an example of streaming extraction. Um, on the far left column, we have kind of the cumulative token that we're imagining our model has generated so far. So generally speaking, each row represents the previous row plus 
a token. Although again, it's not one to one with a tokenizer if we handed it. Um, in the second column, uh, we have the partial responses that you would get by way of partial JSON parsing. Um, again, until the until the entire name field is generated, which is in this row, we keep the partial fields off. So until the name key and the value for it are fully generated, um, the JSON object is empty. Once um, the, the name has been generated, we toggle into incomplete mode, which is why you'll see um, like once the location field is present and it starts generating tokens, you'll see SAN, even though that field hasn't been closed, and then San Fran, and then San Francisco, and then it infers the closure of the JSON object. Um, and then in this column, so this is just the tokens that are tokens that are conceptually generated by the model at each step. And then uh, the fourth column represents the tokens that you are actually able to stream to the client um, at each iteration. This is a difference between OpenAI's compatible, or excuse me, this is the difference between OpenAI's tool streaming and VLLM's tool streaming is VLLM cannot stream a argument diff for every token that's generated because sometimes um, it is a control character or it doesn't close out a field and so there would be an empty diff. This doesn't break anything, it's still compatible. I tested it with a variety of libraries, but you can see an empty arguments diff sometimes. Um, so I think from this, it's kind of easy to see what I meant about how we can't stream the raw tokens of the JSON argument that's being generated here, um, that we can stream those raw tokens to the client as the model generates them. The name and arguments have to be in different fields of the OpenAI completion delta that I showed earlier, for starters. The second is that while the model is generating the function called JSON object, first of all, we're not streaming name ever. We're just streaming a delta that includes a name field and the complete um, value of the function name. And then again, stringified deltas of the arguments object um we're not so we're not just kind of streaming tokens for an entire object at once to the client um so given the object that that we parsed um in the second column we have to figure out how to actually extract the diff from the previous step and send it to the client that's that's kind of the core challenge partial json parsing itself is a solved problem um I used a library for this um, in my implementation. So that fortunately was something that we didn't have to implement from scratch, but implementing um, the actual difference extraction is tricky and did have to be implemented from scratch. Um, I apologize for the tenant memes in advance. I like the movie Tenet and um, the streaming extraction process is kind of circular and you have to approach it from both directions, which will make more sense in a little bit. Um, so let's take a, a single example of argument streaming here. Um, and in this case, we're assuming we've already streamed the name. Um, and so each subsequent row in this spreadsheet, um, is the new models generation, um, after a new token is generated from the previous row. So we do partial JSON parsing on the generation, which is the field on the left, minus the tool call tokens that indicate the call. And then once we have a JSON object representing this, we take the um, the arguments field and then we stringify that, which is what we have in this column is the stringified field or the stringified arguments field from the partially JSON parsed um, object. Mm -hmm. So then what we have to do to extract the diff that we actually stream to the client is um, we have to compare the the current version of this argument string from what we had in uh, the previous iteration when the previous token was generated. Um, and so we have to compare those two things. And so in here, the comparison is done in green. You can start from the beginning of the two stringified arguments objects to see where the difference between the two starts. So in the second and third rows, they match up to where the green ends and then the black and red parts are different. Um, so it just from a string matching perspective, um, the difference between the second, between when this token has been generated and when this one has been, um, the difference is that there is the Cisco backslash quote bracket quote. I think I have an extra bracket there by accident. Um, 
but so importantly, um, you'll note there's that quote and then the brackets, which are not present in the model generation. Um, there could be other arguments coming. There could be, you know, for example, the state that the city's in, um, the unit Fahrenheit or Celsius and so forth. So the partial JSON parsing always gives you a completed JSON object because it has to, that's what it's doing. Um, and even when the model hasn't generated those closed tokens yet. So the problem is that now our diff contains things um, that the language model hasn't generated yet because the partial JSON parsing inferred that they would be there in order to close and complete a JSON object that we could stringify so that it's properly escaped. So we can't stream those tokens yet, like I said, because there's other arguments that could still be generated. Um, and similarly, we can't infer that a quote or two brackets will necessarily mean the end of the function call in arguments delta because you could have nested objects inside of that arguments object. Um, so because of this, we can't infer that the object has been closed. We can't pretend that it has, even though um, the partial JSON parser thinks that it has been. So to solve this, uh, where our diff contains characters that haven't happened yet, we need to diff the stringified objects um, from the uh, partially JSON or partial JSON object in reverse from the end of the string towards the beginning. Um, so you can see that now instead of the green starting on the left and moving right until there's a difference, the green starts on the right and moves left until there's a difference. Mm. So taking our forward diff um, and our backwards diff, we get and, and subtracting them from each other, we get the correct difference from the generated arguments that should be streamed to the client, right? So when we start from the beginning, two slides ago, um, we get Cisco backslash quote brackets. Um, when we diff from the back, we get backslash quote brackets. And so we subtract the backwards diff from the forwards diff, which leads us with just Cisco. Um, so that's, in this case, the diff that we would send to the client and the thing that would be appropriate to send. So at a basic level, that's that's kind of how tool streaming works, is you have to figure out, you know, from two JSON objects, where is the difference in the middle of them um, while not sending characters that haven't been generated yet, even once they've been inferred. Uh, the problem is that it gets worse. Um, there are edge cases, depending on models, formats, um, and depending on the tokens that you're generating, this is one that um, I actually ran into and that the algorithm has to account for. Um, you can see that if you diff um, these two strings from the front, the similarity ends after san, right? Your difference is fran backslash quotes. When you go at this from the reverse, the similarity ends after or before, I guess, after the an in fran. Um, since the previous generation of the model here and uh, the current generation of the model here um, both end with an, right? San ends with an, Fran ends with an. And so differing from the front, you get Fran backslash quote brackets. Differing from the end, um, the similarity is also an backslash quote brackets. And so if you took the difference from these two diffs like we just talked about, what you would actually get is fr. Um, which is um, not what the model generated and not what the, the diff should be because the diff should be ran. Um, so the algorithm has to be smart enough to account for this. Um, a, a, a simple forward and backward diff isn't enough. Um, this, this took a long time to figure out, actually, because it only happened for certain words like San Francisco, I think Celsius was one of them, um, but it's fairly uncommon. And I kind of spent a lot of time trying to figure out why sometimes characters would be missing um, from diffs. And, and so the extracted tool call would just randomly be missing characters from an argument value. So looking at the second image, um, this is basically the solution to the problem. And so what you end up having to do is take the first partially parsed arguments object, calculate the forwards diff, like we talked about, um, and then you're left with the different portion, right? So a forward diff is um, location and san, the different portion is the brackets and fran. Um, so then what we do to, to solve this problem is we actually remove the similar part and then diff against it backwards. Um, and so we find that these match, um, having removed the beginning part where, you know, 
AN and AN would match if we hadn't removed it. Um, and we find the correct diff, which is Bran in this case. Um, and so, by the way, th this example is just the specific implementation of the algorithm. Um, I think in this case for Hermes and Mistral, the implementation does change for some models that don't use JSON style function calls. Some models have different problems. Some models don't have this problem at all. Um, but maybe by now it's kind of obvious why other frameworks haven't implemented this yet. You have to parse things on the fly. You have to account for a ton of different edging corner cases. Um, and you have to create a separate implementation of this algorithm for different models formats. Um, there are other problems like sequential tool calls, um, handling fault tolerance is, is kind of difficult, um, error handling and recovery, um, especially for small models, which are error prone. Um, I, I don't have time to go into these today because there's, like I said, there's kind of two months worth of these types of problems that we had to resolve to get the PR merged. Um, but having gone through, um, you know, this problem now, which, um, I found was pretty interesting while trying to implement, uh, this. I can leave you with a, a few things that are hopefully more useful rather than just kind of niche algorithmic issues with extracting um, differences and transforming them on the fly. So best practices for tool calling with VLLM. Um, the first one that I'd recommend to people is to create a custom chat template. Um, models can often be instructed to handle parallel tool calling better. Um, Frequently, you will see models hallucinate tool calls unless you tell them not to. Generally, you want to tell them, you know, only call tools which are available to you um, and which have been listed to you um, because sometimes they'll remember one from their training data that you haven't made available to it and it'll try and call that. So custom chat templates, built-in system prompts. Um, sometimes some uh, models chat templates also don't handle well if tools if the tools array is empty and so you'll tell the agent it's a, or the model that it's a tool calling agent and that it doesn't have any tools. And so it gets confused. Um, quantization can be tricky too. Um, quantization has gotten a lot better in, in the past recent months. Um, you know, again, shout out to neural magic. Their LLM compressor is awesome. The work that they've done on FPA quantization has been awesome. Um, so FP eight is great and totally fine. You lose a negligible amount of precision. Um, a good int8 quantization tends to work well with tool calling, um, like a good AWQ or a kind of a standard int8 is fine, but you have to apply a scaling factor to it. So taking an off the, off the shelf int8 quantization um, or GGUF file that hasn't um, had this kind of scaling factor applied to it properly during creation, you may get bad results. So you really want to make sure that you get a really good int8 quantization. Um, depending on the size of the model and in four quant can really, really struggle to call tools. This is something that I found over and over, um, especially with, um, GGUF quantizations, um, where a scaling factor hasn't been applied properly. Um, you'll just frequently see it and in four model completely fail to call tools. But again, quantization has gotten much better. It will continue to. So these problems may not be around for forever. And then the last one is, again, just double, triple, quadruple check the chat template if you're having issues, even if you're using the official one from the model manufacturer. So generally, models store their chat template in their tokenizer configuration JSON file um, for models that are on Hugging Face. Um, even official chat templates released by the AI lab that... Um, uh, that released the model frequently have bugs. I, I found this on more than two occasions where a lab's off the shelf chat template did not work and had to be adjusted to handle, you know, an edge case, for example, if there were no tools specified or if the tools array was empty, um, or just to provide tweaks to it. Um, if you are having really weird, unexplainable failures or the models like partially generating tool calls and then not getting it right, like I said, it's probably the chat template models are very sensitive to chat templates and tokenization. Um, with respect to tool calling. So, you know, it, it's if you're having a problem, there's a good chance that's the issue. Um, and then just looking forward, the open or the future of open source uh, function and tool calling. 
Um, in the future, it should be a lot easier to fine tune um, function and tool calling models as data sets proliferate. Uh, this was the big problem for a while was that there weren't really good data sets. The ones that were out there had, um, you know, in some cases had a different format than what you were looking for and had to be transformed. Um, or some, some data sets had broken tool calls, which is bad because you don't want to train your model on that. Um, Axolotl is in the process of, if they haven't done it already, um, creating recipes for adding tool calling to models. Um, and then data sets, like I said, are proliferating too. Um, I, um, Salesforce has a good data set, uh, Glaive's function calling data set is good. Uh, News Research has released one that I think is based on those two and a few others. Um, so it will get easier um, to, to fine tune um, models to do tool calling well. Uh, and then with respect to function call formats, like I mentioned, each model or family of models has its own format. Llama has one, Mistral has one, Hermes has one that, that Quen and some other open source labs have adopted. Um, Cohere has one. And so it's kind of the wild west. It feels like the early days of chat templating. Um, I kind of expect to see this converge into a couple of different standards. Obviously, some labs are going to like their format. But, you know, as I mentioned, a lot of places have started adopting uh, Noose's format, for example, or um, there's a lot of Llama fine tunes um, that, that use an adaptation um, of Llama's format. Um, function calling continues to improve on open source small language models. So, um, it you know, you used to not see it on sub 70 billion parameter models. Now it's common on, you know, seven, eight, nine billion parameter models. Uh, Llama just released one and one and three billion parameter models that support tool calling. Um, again, they're really small. They they can struggle with it more than bigger models do. But you know that's something that will continue to improve. And then also better tool chain support. Um, the tools for building agentic applications will continue to improve. Um, and this is one of the things that this was you know that I was trying to address is. Um, to help people who are using VLLM as part of their tool chain to improve their tool chain so that you can use VLLM for agentic applications. Um, VLLM has a really big role in all of this. Um, it's the first open source inference and serving framework to support tool streaming, as I mentioned. That's a really big deal because it means if you are building user interactive application um, where you need streaming and you want to be able to use tools, functions, agentic capabilities, VLLM is the only framework that you can do that with right now, which is a really big deal um, for the VLLM community. Um, and it's one of the reasons we've seen a lot of interest in this feature. Um, VLLM's tool architecture is very extensible. Um, so it includes parsers for popular models. I'll have a table of this on the next slide. It's already out of date because there's so much work on this. Um, but also like chat templates, it's easy to bring your own tool parser. So if you're working with a specific model that there's not a, uh, parser for, there's a kind of an API that allows you to write your own parser and load it at runtime, just like how you can load a, a chat template at runtime so that you, you know, can, can use a format that VLLM doesn't support without having to fork VLLM and create a pull request. Although obviously we do encourage, um, people to do that. Um, VLLM has gotten day zero support for, you know, new language models, um, including, um, Mistral and, and Quen and so forth. And it's actually been officially recommended by multiple AI labs, especially with respect to serving them with tool calling capabilities in Alibaba's Quen 2.5 release blog. They specifically recommended using VLLM with the, um, Hermes format tool parser for serving it, um, for people that that wanted to host it themselves so there's a lot of people just kind of relying on um the llm for this it's really becoming the kind of standard inference platform for building um, open source agentic applications uh really quickly this is the brief list of um models with either an existing tool parser or one in progress for vllm um this is already out of date because there are a couple others now that are work in progress. Um, but yeah, the uh, Hermes model, I think the granite ones are landed, right? Um, they had not as of last night. Um, when I went through testing again, they may have been merged this morning because I think they were ready 
I, there was a CI issue with the um, the 20B model on the AMD chips. Okay. Um, yeah. But yeah, no. so... Go ahead. Sorry, that was merged this morning. Yeah, just to confirm. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so there there's a lot of work on this. Um, the Quen models are included in that. Um, the Mistral family of models. Um, the Llama family of models 3.1. It isn't listed here, um, but Llama 3.2, the 1 and 3 billion parameter models use a different format. So there's a separate parser for that that's a work in progress. Um, but the Llama 3.1 JSON format parser should not be expected to work for those models. Um, Jamba, Intern LM, um, yeah, Granite 3.0, and the 20B models, which are separate formats. Um, OpenBNB's mini CPM, um, which is exciting because it's multimodal, um, as are, I think, some of the Quen um, and Llama 3.2 models that are, you know, multimodal with tools, which is another thing that's a relatively new development. You know, frequently you would get either a multimodal model or one with tool call capabilities. Uh, recently, we've seen, you know, a lot of models start to have both, which is really great. Uh, and then just a couple of FAQs, and then I, I'll kind of wrap things up with a demo to kind of show what we can actually do with this feature. Um, if your model isn't supported, um, please create a, a PR and add a tool parser. Um, you know, we we all love contributions, and um, it, it helps everyone. It's a collaborative effort. Um, like I mentioned, that you know, on that table, I think I showed that there's three open PRs. Um, last I checked last night, there were in the neighborhood of about six. Um, I made this slide a few, a few days ago. Um, we initially launched with two parsers, actually. Now there's five parsers, six supported families, and, and as I mentioned, more on the way. Um, you also can bring your own parser, just like a chat template, um, without creating a PR if you need to. Um, there are, there's documentation on how to do that in the VLLM documentation. And if you don't need streaming, you just need to basically write a Python class that uses a regex and does some parsing, maybe 10, 20 lines of code. It's super simple to do that. Um, and then, yeah, kind of the, the tip is just go to docs.vllm.ai and search tool parser, and you'll find what you're looking for. I think uh, one of the main questions that I, I'm also interested in, like a refresher myself, is like explaining the benefit of like partial JSON decoding uh, from a Delta stream. Like basically, is there like uh, <clears throat> an application that would specifically make use of this, uh, or is it, you know, kind of towards matching what OpenAI and what Anthropic do, you know, with artifacts and and code and and those sort of streaming structurally within their chat applications? Uh, yes. So that's a great question. Um, the answer is both that it was done for compatibility, but also there are. Um, applications where you do actually care about streaming arguments diffs on the fly. Um, just like how the server is partially parsing the JSON arguments on the server, um, what we can do by streaming the name as soon as it's available, even before the entire object has been generated, is for user interactive applications, you can provide the user feedback about what the model's doing um, you know, even as it's doing it. So as soon as that name is available, you can tell it, hey, I'm search, you could tell the user, you know, for example, if it's a web search tool that's being called, you can tell it, hey, I'm searching the web for you, right? So it, it lets you create a better user experience by increasing the amount of feedback you can give to the user. Um, you know, it, you can increase interactivity. Um, it just kind of like with, with regular chat streaming, you know, the benefit is the user can see you what the model is doing as it's doing it, even though it's not done yet. Um, I The demo that I'm going to do here in a couple minutes um, will hopefully kind of illustrate this. You'll be able to see like how it lets you build a more interactive user interface. Um, and and so, but, but yes, it, there are use cases where you can partially parse the argument stiff that you get from the stream on the client as well, and then show the user something about the work that's going on um, as it's going on. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, you know, kind of like perplexity when they're like searching uh, mm -hmm. or yeah, doing tools. Um, and yeah, if you're building, you know, if you're building a platform or an application, like giving users feedback instead of making them stare at a loading spinner while the models, you know, calling tools or finishing streaming and argument stiff, um, you know, can meet a big difference in terms of like decreasing bounce rates and, and, um, uh, you know, conversions. So it's like, it, it's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. 
Great answer. Uh, and then there's a question on like basically the two cases, uh, which I think we ran into like last week is like if we enable tool choice, it goes to the di guided decoding backend, which uses outlines or uh, LM mm -hmm. prompt, you know, I think is the name. And then if we yeah. use the enable auto tool choice function, it goes towards the methods you're talking about here where it's it's uh right yes quality. yes so there yeah there's a couple gotchas um one is yes if you're using tool choice um it will use outlines or guided or lm format enforcer as the other back end um which can the first time that you're the model is seeing a tool it will increase the length of time that it takes for the tool to be generated because um um because it has to compile a finite state machine um, that, that that handles the guided decoding. I also don't know if that supports streaming, actually. Um, it may just stream it as a regular chat completion. Um, for if you specify auto in the tool choice field, um, it will use the streaming parser. Um, I, I think related to that, there's a question, are there plans to support OpenAI's strict field in tool definitions? to ensure proper structured output. Um, so by default for, um, as I noted in the deck, the arguments you receive for a function, it's a, J, a stringified JSON. It's not a JSON object. OpenAI's API does not by default guarantee that the arguments are actually valid JSON. They say it's up to the user to um, validate and parse those. That's what the LLM does as well. I'm assuming, and and I'm actually not familiar with the strict mode, but that what it does is it does guarantee that that those arguments are valid JSON and that they match the schema. Um, that is something that could be implemented in VLLM. Um, it's not right now. What you would probably have to do is once the model starts calling a tool, it would have to call at least the part up through where the name has been generated properly, so that you know which which tool's schema to use. And then once it starts generating arguments, you use guided decoding until the end of the arguments object to force generating arguments according to that schema. Um, and at which point you would toggle guided decoding back off, you know, in case the model wanted to generate text after the tool call. Um, that's That hasn't been done right now because that requires a, a more in-depth refactoring I, because right now it's not possible to turn guided generation on and off in the middle of a request, although that's certainly a possibility. Um, I hope that answers that question. Um, yeah, I think that was that was pretty spot on. Uh, I, I do need to hop. Uh, so I think uh, if, if you could finish up with the with demo with Sasha and, and answer any questions, I think that'd be awesome. Yeah, okay. Um, okay. And then yeah, just kind of Going through the rest of the questions, if you enable tool choice, yes, it goes to de guided decoding. Um, enabling, using the enable auto tool choice flag um, uses the tool parser, but if you have that flag set in the server and you use tool choice, it's still going to use the guided decoding backend. Um, how is performance comparing using uh versus for guided decoding versus this feature um so guided decoding as i mentioned the first time that the model sees a particular um tool schema it has to compile a finite state machine which can take depending on how complicated the schema is it can be very fast or it can take multiple seconds um so this prevents that overhead um, as best as we can tell, um, there's very little overhead to this. It, it's all CPU bound. Um, like the parsing is all CPU bound. It's not IO bound. It's, you know, as fast as the model can generate tokens um, off of the GPU process, they're being pushed to the OpenAI server, which is on the CPU and not preempting the GPU. Um, and it's just doing some, like the algorithm's kind of complicated, but from the CPU standpoint, it's not a lot of work. Um, so there's there's negligible performance overhead um, for uh, tool streaming. Um, there's a question about, is there a recommended kind of best tool calling format or standard? Um, I I think we're, we're starting to see some convergence in the space. I, I don't want to kind of say one format is, um, is the best. I tend to like the ones that use... Um, you know, 
kind of, I guess, like both nooses and mistrolls that have a token that indicates the start of the tool call that makes it very easy right off the bat to figure out whether the streaming parser needs to be enabled. And then it's streaming JSON. That's that's kind of the easiest thing for us to implement. But um, I'm really personally intrigued by the idea of tool calling that doesn't use JSON at all, because for a structured output, JSON uses... Uh, it, it's very flexible, but it uses way more tokens than it needs to. And you could very easily do something with like YAML or TOML or something resembling kind of like a just a simple delimited um, structure that would be much simpler than JSON. Um, so that would be entirely different for parsing, but might be easier for models to generate if it's less token dense and less complicated. Um... Um, there's a question about the chat completions API as the standard for tool choice and why not the assistance API? Um, I think it's just because the chat completions API was around first and, um, you know, we, there's a lot of other things in the assistance API that I don't think we're able to offer yet. Um, this is an example of a very simple, um, kind of text to SQL based agent. Um, it's built on top of the LLM. It's using News Research's Hermes 8B, uh, Hermes 3AB model, which I'm personally partial to. I find that it works very, very well with multi-turn tool calling, um, especially for a small model. Um, the front end is built on Next.js, um, and it's using Versal's AI SDK. And, and the reason that I mention that is because it has a feature that uh, it's the the experimental tool streaming feature and it lets you kind of update your UI as arguments diffs are received. Um, so the what that basically means is it makes it much, much, much easier than it would otherwise be to give interactivity to the application as the arguments are being generated. So um, I think the easiest way to explain that is just going to be to show it. Um, so the agent knows what the database's schema is, and then it just has a tool that it um, can call to execute a read-based query, and um, it it will then provide the results and, and format them however you instruct it to. Um, so in this case, you know you can see it generated a table, but what you should really pay attention to, and I'm going to just ask you a few more questions, is um, kind of this little artifacts type window that I made, um, what this is doing is it's displaying the output of e of the tool each time it's calling it. So as soon as the name is generated, you'll see the name appear. And then the tool has two arguments. The first is a reasoning field and the reasoning always comes before the query um, because you know we try and benefit from language models, autoregressive properties. Um, but you'll actually see its reasoning, which is an argument in the tool. It's not generating text yet, right? When it generates a text-based chat completion, you'll see it over here. Over here, everything you see is um, streamed as part of the tool. So the name is streamed, the reasoning argument is streamed, and then this is an actual SQL query that you'll kind of see it, it typing out as those diffs are being sent. Um, so I'm just kinda, kinda gonna go through and ask it a bunch more questions. Um, and so you, you can watch as it kind of generates the reasoning field in the tools argument. Uh, and so you can see it's, in this case, kind of doing a multi-turn tool calling because um, it didn't get it right on the first time. So that's, um, yeah, that's kind of, the demo, it's very short and sweet, um, but hopefully you can see, you know, it, it in this artifacts window, um, you know, the benefits of being able to stream tool, um, you know, tool names and arguments to the UI is that it, it lets you get interactive much, uh, much faster and give instant feedback to the user about what the model is doing and how it's doing it, um, you know, without having to wait for an entire tool call to be generated. It, it doesn't feel like a long time, um, you know, in this. Um, but, you know, if you had to wait for the entire thing to be generated, it you're looking at an extra five seconds before you can show the user anything, right? As this wheel is spinning, you'd be waiting otherwise. 
Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the demo. 